Hey everybody, this is Darren Van Dam, and you are watching Flick Connection, the show that helps you get more out of movies, and today I'm going to be telling you about 20 of the absolute best movies currently available on Netflix. So since most of my subscribers come to me for hidden gem movies, movies that are lesser known that you've probably missed, this list is actually going to include 10 lesser known movies and then I'm going to give you my personal top 10 movies currently available on Netflix. So even though Slight is put all the way at the back of a list of 20, I still regard it as one of the better movies Netflix has recently added. So Slight is a science fiction movie directed by J.D. Dillard who did another Another science fiction movie also available on Netflix called Sweetheart. But it's about a young street magician who clearly has some sleight of hand, but there's something else going on. He's got something else in his back pocket that is helping him with his sleight of hand. So you get that mixed in with a coming of age thing where a young kid is trying to not get sort of swept up by the streets. It's got a little bit of a genre bending thing going on. Easily the lowest budget, sort of smallest movie on this list, but it still makes the list because it is quite good. The Outpost is based on true events and plays out kind of like a low budget Black Hawk Down. However, I think it's still a very nice delivery. I think anybody who likes these types of warfare movies is going to really like The Outpost. One thing that I was a little surprised by is how long, not just the movie is, but how long the story is. It develops and goes in multiple directions. It almost feels kind of like a mini-series before everything goes to hell towards the end and you get this massive shootout, which is, again, based on true events. Again, I highly recommend this for people who like these types of movies. They make a lot of them, and there's a lot of them that are very low budget that are pretty terrible. This one, for a lower budget effort, is exceptional. A low-key crime drama that came out during the pandemic that only just got recently added to Netflix actually goes by two names. You'll find it, depending on what region you're in, under the name Calm with Horses or The Shadow of Violence, which I think is a more appropriate title. Now, yes, there are some horses in the movie, but in terms of the movie, they play a very, very small role. This is a violent movie about a very violent person. Essentially what you've got with this movie is you're following a couple of low level enforcers for an organized crime family and things begin to unravel as they do in these types of movies. So it's fairly simple but you've got some fantastic performances all around. Even some of the smaller supporting roles are really stand out in this movie. It's got a slower pace to it and everything but if you tend to like gangster movies, things like that, while this is isn't an overblown one and doesn't really focus on this organized crime family as a whole. You're really narrowly focusing on one or two main characters. It's very interesting, so I think people that are fans of that genre should absolutely check this out while it's still on Netflix. Longtime subscribers know I don't often recommend romantic comedies. In fact, it's extremely rare, mostly because they tend to be the same movie remade and repackaged. But one of my absolute favorites is on Netflix right now. It stars Sam Rockwell as Mr. Right. Now, in this movie, Anna Kendrick plays her typical self. It's not a knock against her, but she's got a type and she's playing it pretty strong here. However, she meets Sam Rockwell, who is a crazy, for lack of a better word, hitman. It's a lot of condoms. Not only is a hitman, but he seems to be maybe like the best one to have ever lived. It's done for comedic purposes and it works. He's incredibly funny in this movie, incredibly charming, their chemistry works, and there's a quite a bit of action in it. This isn't gonna scratch your action movie itch, but if you find most romantic comedies to be kind of dull and boring, this one has a unique twist to it that makes it a ton of fun and still scratches that romantic comedy itch. It's a funny date night movie. A fair warning, the head count is pretty high, but everything's done just right in the right kind of balance to make it fun and entertaining without really ever getting too morbid and without ever getting too sappy either. I actually have two movies on this list directed by Martin Scorsese, who is easily my favorite director of all time. And while his most recent movie, The Irishman, is not on this list, there is another movie that takes place 
place in a similar world that also has Irishmen in the title. It's called Kill the Irishman. Now this is another mob movie that focuses on someone called the Irishman. However, it is a completely different person. This is based on the true story of Danny Green, an Irishman who did have a hit put out on him by the mafia and they had a very hard time killing this man. This movie is absolutely packed with car explosions, probably a record for car bombs in a movie. In this one, you've also got a great but short-lived role from Christopher Walken. And then you've got some really great scenes that just feel like they're from classic mob movies. There's a fantastic scene where he breaks up a biker party. Just good stuff. Now, production-wise, it is quite a bit below something like The Irishman. However, if you feel like The Irishman maybe put you to sleep a little bit, I mean, it was four hours, then Kill The Irishman might be more up your alley. One of the creepiest non-horror movies to have been recently added to Netflix is The Clove Hitch Killer. Now, I know I covered it and Slight in my Everything Coming to Netflix in May video, but I wanna spend a little more time talking about this movie because I really, really like this one. If you're a fan of all the great true crime stuff on Netflix, The Clove Hitch Killer is fiction, but it does play out like true crime, so I think fans of that genre will really dig The Clove Hitch Killer. And in this movie, Dylan McDermott plays a father whose son is in the Boy Scouts, just a good, well-rounded boy, but he begins to suspect that his dad might be the notorious Clove Hitch Killer. There are elements of this movie that are loosely based on the BTK Killer, but the bulk of the story is this boy trying to figure out if his father is who he appears to be or if he is this horrific serial killer. And Dylan McDermott really brings it. He is not the star of the movie, but he is doing some great work here. There is a scene at the dinner table that gave me chills. But if you're into serial killer movies, true crime stuff, anything like that, The Clove Hitch Killer needs to go on your watch soon list. Awkward talk with Dad. Over. The most intense movie on this list brings a true natural disaster to screen. I think better than any other movie has done before it. That movie is called The Impossible. This is based on the events of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. While there are other characters, this movie does follow a family who are on vacation, played by Naomi Watts, Hugh McGregor, and a young Tom Holland before he became Spider-Man. Like I said, the actual event, the natural disaster, the wave crashing into this resort and town is one of the most realistic scenes of its kind I've ever seen on film. It's very intense, it feels very real, and the aftermath, the destruction of the tsunami looks legitimate. It's not halfway done. The production on this movie is incredible and it does add to the overall experience. It immerses you, makes it feel real. You feel the intensity of the water, how devastating this event actually was. And it's about this family who do become separated trying to figure out who's still alive and how to find each other. It really does put you there. So make sure you're in the right mood for it, but for what it is and what it tries to accomplish, it is just expertly done. Now there's a big budget fantasy movie with tons of visual effects and a great cast that still manages to be underwatched and underappreciated, even though it's been on Netflix for well over a year. That is Stardust. Director Matthew Vaughn did this movie in 2007, right after his first feature film, Layer Cake, but before Kick-Ass and then X-Men First Class, and I think this is just an absolutely fantastic movie. Fans of classics like The Princess Bride should not let this movie slip under their radar. In fact, if you love The Princess Bride and have never discovered Stardust, you're welcome. This is your new favorite movie. That's how good this movie is. And it's not even really my type of thing, and I think it is just fantastic. It's this epic adventure with all these different characters and worlds and it's visually stunning from beginning to end. Matthew Vaughn is just a pro at keeping things entertaining and keeping things moving and Stardust is just a great example of that and not only that it is somewhat family friendly. I mean it's rated PG-13 so you don't want to watch this with very young kids but this is one you could watch with the family, this is one you could watch on a date night, this is one you could watch by yourself and be thoroughly entertained from beginning to end. There are a lot of movies similar to this very, very few of them end up being as good as Stardust. Speaking of successful directors, Taika Waititi would go on to direct Thor Ragnarok and the Oscar-nominated Jojo Rabbit after my next pick, 
the hunt for the wilder people. Now, prior to this, he did What We Do in the Shadows, which is a hilarious movie, and then he went on to do this coming of age story, which again does not seem like something I would be interested in, but I absolutely love this movie, and I truly do think it's one of the best things available on Netflix right now. In this movie, a young boy is sent to live with a foster family and ends up running off into the wilds of New Zealand, where he and his foster father, I guess we'll call him, played by Sam Neill, eventually become stranded, and it becomes a survival movie somewhat, but always, always a coming of age story about this young boy, played by Julian Dennison, who has gone on to be in Deadpool 2, Godzilla vs. Kong, but in this movie, he is absolutely hilarious. You're looking at a young man with impeccable comedic timing, possibly a very bright future ahead of him if he can just stay off the smack. I don't know that he has a smack problem, by the way. I just know it's a common problem with child actors. But this is just a beautifully done movie that is very funny from beginning to end, but never feels like a slapstick, silly comedy. It brushes up against that pretty closely more than once, but it stays really grounded and again, just has that wit that you're only really gonna get from New Zealand comedy. I mentioned Martin Scorsese being my favorite director and I think easily his most beautiful and most underappreciated movie has gotta be Hugo. This is his only real attempt at a family friendly movie and Hugo is disguised as something for kids when it is really this beautiful movie about filmmaking. Another movie that I didn't inherently have any interest in other than the fact that Martin Scorsese directed it. And then halfway through, I don't want to call it a twist, but something changes in the story and the meaning of this movie dramatically changes. It's a stunning movie to look at. It's one of the most beautiful things currently available on Netflix and you can watch it with the kids. This is rated PG. Some of the themes are gonna go over their heads, but there's enough there I think to entertain fairly young kids and if you're really paying attention, enough there to really hook you to, especially if you love movies half as much as I do. But no matter how much you love movies or how much you watch them, odds are you'd be interested in unlocking even more movies with your current Netflix subscription. Today's sponsor, CyberGhost VPN, will allow you to do that because not only do they keep your web browsing safe, secure, and private like all VPNs do, but CyberGhost has specialized servers for Netflix, Prime Video, Hulu, all the major streaming services in multiple countries. So with the flick of a switch, you can be watching Netflix in the UK, in Germany, Australia, Canada, and they they have vastly different libraries than what you have in your country. So if you find out all the movies I recommend on this channel are available to you, you can unlock them using CyberGhost. And right now my viewers can pay as low as $2.19 a month to do this, to unlock way more movies and shows. CyberGhost is super easy to use and they have a 45 day money back guarantee so there's virtually no risk. They also have great 24 seven customer support to help you get it set up on multiple devices. Speaking of devices, you can use it on up to seven at the same time and it's all the different types of devices you use. So again, go to the link in the description below, pay as low as $2.19. That's less than half the cost of one new release movie rental to unlock completely new libraries in multiple countries. It is a hard deal to beat in terms of just bang for your buck, but let's go ahead and move on with my top 10 on this list. So just as a quick reminder, my bottom 10 on this list were just lesser known hidden gem movies, but they're some of my absolute favorite on Netflix right now. My top 10 are my top 10 absolute favorite movies on Netflix right now. Now, truly good comedy movies are pretty rare, especially nowadays, but good movies about food are even more rare, and to have one that does both really, really well is exceptional, but Chef nails it. I absolutely love this movie. It's so easily consumable and accessible, yet it doesn't pander to the audience. It feels very real, and I think that's because this comes from a real place. Now, this movie is directed by Jon Favreau, who also stars in it, and in this movie, he's sort of an embattled chef who's fighting with the owner of a restaurant played by Dustin Hoffman, and ends up leaving a pretty prestigious position at a restaurant to go open up a food truck. Now, the reason it's relevant is because Favreau himself did something similar. He took a break after directing Iron Man and Iron Man 2, and then came back with this movie, and then has gone on to do movies like The Jungle Book, he brought The Mandalorian to life, and I suspect that the conflict in Chef comes from 
a real place with Favreau trying to figure out what to do with his craft. So through that lens, it's great. Through this father-son relationship, it's great. Watching it just as a foodie, it's fantastic. Fair warning though, line something up to eat. You're gonna want Cuban sandwiches or something like that while watching this movie. So plan ahead with Uber Eats or however you're gonna get food like that because you're gonna be hungry. But I cannot recommend this movie enough. Now the movie, and I do mean the movie, to help popularize martial arts in the United States is also Bruce Lee's best movie, hands down, Enter the Dragon. Now many people would refer to this as the godfather of martial arts movies, and in a lot of ways it is. These types of movies would not be nearly as popular as they are in the US today, if not for Enter the Dragon. But you also wouldn't see different types of martial arts dojos in every single strip mall in the country if not for this movie. In addition to that, it's just a really badass flick about a giant fight tournament. It also kind of feels like a James Bond movie. It's not just that Bruce Lee is cool because of all the things I just said. I mean, he's legitimately a cool motherfucker in this movie. It's, it's really slick stuff. If you've never seen it, there is a reason it's a classic. It holds up today. Yeah, some of the effects, especially some of the sound mixing and things are dated, but even that is part of the flavor of this movie. Movie lovers, movie buffs, I don't think there's a way around it. You have to watch Enter the Dragon at some point. You might as well watch it while it's on Netflix. Director Gore Verbinski is known for creating just beautiful movies, movies like Pirates of the Caribbean and Mouse Hunt, but his only animated feature is no exception. Rango is easily one of the best animated movies to have come out since the turn of the century. I put this up there with some of the top picks from Pixar Studios. And it's terribly underappreciated. In this movie, Johnny Depp voices Rango, a chameleon who gets lost out in the desert. And essentially what you've got is a classic Western with this movie. But not only that, it is an epic classic Western. There are multiple big, broad action sequences with a lot of things going on in them for an animated movie. I do think story-wise it gets lost in the weeds a little bit, but that's kind of par for the course with Gore Verbinski. This is one of his best movies though. And then speaking of the best movies of the century, my next pick, 15 years later, is still holding strong as one of the funniest movies over the past several decades, and that is super bad. So I am not overstating it. I have rewatched it recently, and all the jokes still land. They all still hold up. In fact, most of the jokes and what is said in this movie would not be put out by a major studio today whatsoever. Just showing you how quickly the culture has changed, but everything in this movie is still absolutely hilarious. I mean, Jonah Hill would go on to get nominated for multiple Academy Awards, and you can see it here. He is extremely funny. The two of them, even though they're very young, they come across like a classic comedy duo. And it's just pure comedy magic in this movie. In fact, I'm gonna stop gushing about it and just give you some of my favorite lines from the movie. If I paced myself, I'd be having at least steady sex with a decent looking girl. I honestly see now why Orson Welles ate his fat ass to death. Yeah, I mean, it's not too bad. I mean, it should be okay. I'm not too worried about it, really. Don't worry about it. I'm not worried at all. I wash and dry. I'm like a single mother. Just kind of sit around all day and draw pictures of dicks. What? I don't see the harm in bringing one little condom. And one little bottle of spermicidal lube? Yeah, one little bottle of spermicidal lube. He's also seen a lot of love, but they're never gonna see another love. Be careful, because it's a meaningful sweater and it means vintage. Okay. Oh, yeah, that vintage it's market. <laughs> a crackhead stole our cruiser and did God knows what with it. You cool to sign that? Of course, I owe you guys my life. We owe you, but wait, what's your real name again? Fogel. Ah, f that, we're calling you McLovin. Yeah, man, they go nuts for that male camel toe. Yeah, the yeah. camel tail. It's, yeah. it's right. I know where it is, where it happens. Released in 1967, far and away the oldest movie on this list, Bonnie and Clyde actually ushered in a new 
era of filmmaking. Things that the 70s are known for, sex and violence and sort of new styles of filmmaking and editing, sort of a more raw approach. Bonnie and Clyde did not necessarily innovate all of that, but it was the first time that mass audiences saw the types of gore and violence that are commonplace in movies today. New editing styles from France were taken and used to bring to a big budget American movie. It was the first time people saw things like that. And again, 1967 is sort of this horizon line where a ton of amazing movies came to life in the years that followed Bonnie and Clyde as a direct result of Bonnie and Clyde. So yet again, movie buffs of any sort, you don't really have a choice. You need to see Bonnie and Clyde because not only is it very good, but it's gonna frame the way you view so many movies that were made before, but more importantly, after it. Another favorite director of mine is Guillermo del Toro, and I think easily his best movie is Pan's Labyrinth. Not only is this a wonderful fantasy story about this young girl that has an incredible arc and just a fantastic story and meaning and everything behind it, but he also brought this incredibly rich world to life using almost nothing but practical effects. Now, he is using CGI in places to cover up some of the puppetry and things, but most of what your eyeballs are seeing is actually there, and you can totally tell. It makes such a difference and immerses you in the world so much better. As good as CGI has gotten, and as much as it has done to help improve movies, small things that you would have never noticed, it has also really handcuffed creators in a way where they're not doing things like this anymore. And Pan's Labyrinth came out right in the middle of all that and it still works today. It looks just as good as it looked when it came out back then and is just as effective at being creepy and unsettling at every single turn. It is a masterpiece. I don't know that Del Toro will ever be able to top this movie. Yeah, he's had movies that have been more acclaimed and won more awards since then, but they have yet to be as perfect as Pan's Labyrinth. If it's been a while since you've watched it, it is easily one of the absolute best movies on Netflix right now. Now we talked about Martin Scorsese earlier, but I think one of his best and most underappreciated efforts has gotta be Shutter Island. Now hold on, I'm not saying it's his best movie, but in terms of what he's able to do as a director, all the subtle little things that you don't really notice on a first watch, they're present in Shutter Island more than they are, not just in anything he's done, but more than you almost ever see. This is an incredibly rich movie that warrants multiple viewings, but it doesn't appear to be that on the first pass. It appears to be a little bit by the book. There's a twist in it that feels familiar, like you've seen it before, yet it still delivers and does a really nice little beautiful trick towards the end. However, after multiple viewings, the amount of detail packed into this movie make it so much more rich to watch the second time around. A lot of it's in the performances, some of it's in the set design, details in the costuming are all visible. I mean, it's, a, it's like a completely different movie. Every single frame has some sort of clue as to what's going on, yet all of that was invisible on the first pass. It is a masterpiece of storytelling. Even though it's not my favorite Martin Scorsese movie, it is a beautiful magic trick of a movie. The only real flaw is that the ultimate twist is something we've seen used quite a few times before, which I think weakened the overall overall effect. However, it's still, it's done in a way that I think no other directors could have done, could have, could have made it as rich, and maybe it didn't need to be as rich as he made it, but damn, he did a good job with this movie. Another one of my all-time favorite directors is Paul Thomas Anderson, and while I love Boogie Nights, which you can currently catch on HBO Max, and The Master, which is also available on Netflix, my favorite Paul Thomas Anderson movie is There Will Be Blood. I have loved this movie since the first frame came up in the movie theater, watched it multiple times in the movie theater, have watched it multiple times since. I love everything about it. I love the score by Johnny Greenwood. I love the cinematography. Obviously, Daniel Day-Lewis's performance is fantastic, but I happen to think it's maybe his best. Yes, there are some things he's done in other movies that are maybe a little more impressive, but there are some subtleties to this performance and some not so subtle things that are just incredible to watch. 
It's just extremely sophisticated to where, again, every scene, there's something happening that you're not being told, but that you can see, and you'll miss it if you're just sort of passively watching. Movie making today has really spoiled the way to watch things, yet taking in movies like There Will Be Blood trains your brain, I think, to view things visually and not just wait for the information to be given to you. Which brings me to my next thought, and that's that a lot of people, Martin Scorsese included, I've said that cinema is dying. In fact, if you just Google that phrase, you're gonna come up with tons of articles and videos on the subject. And those people are largely right. The way that the Hollywood machine works today doesn't really allow for the type of creative freedom that births so many fantastic films over the decades. However, because technology is easier to get a hold of, there are really amazing movies being made on lower budgets than ever before. And Uncut Gems is a great example of a modern day movie that is breaking ground, but is still done in a traditional filmmaking style. In fact, this was actually produced by Martin Scorsese and feels a lot like some of his older works. If you've ever seen Mean Streets, it's one of my favorites of his. Uncut Gems reminds me a lot of it in a lot of ways. Very different characters, takes place in a completely different decade, but has a similar pacing to it. And it's a similar type of movie, meaning it's fairly plotless, yet you're really following these characters. It's a slice of this world, and there's a lot of intensity with this movie. And this is done by some young filmmakers who are around my age, they're called the Safdie Brothers, and they are brilliant for wanting to put Adam Sandler in this movie. Because Adam Sandler is a man who has built his career on being a man-child in every single movie, and in Uncut Gems, he is another type of man-child, but it's a very real representation of one, and you see the consequences of never growing up in this movie. It's wild stuff, it's very effective stuff, it makes me excited to see not only filmmakers doing stuff like this, but to see movies like this do well. A24 is a major production company that does a lot of indie movies. This is by far their highest grossing movie, and that is very encouraging to me. I hope we get more movies like this in the future. It's not necessarily for everybody, but if you tend to like my recommendations, this is gonna be a good pick for you. Now in a recent video, I mentioned that I felt like Scarface was one of the most overrated movies of all time. Now, while I still stand by that statement, it still makes the number one pick on this list. Let me explain. So Scarface is a masterpiece. It's beautifully directed by Brian De Palma. Amazing performance, not just from Al Pacino, but everybody on screen, including Michelle Pfeiffer, really bring their A game. The movie does obviously feel dated, but you can watch this one just like Bonnie and Clyde and see all of the influence that it brought to the table. They're still making movies like this purely based on the success, purely based on the continued success of Scarface. They can easily slap some crap movie together, and as long as the poster and the marketing makes it sound like it's remotely like Scarface, enough people will watch it to pay for what it costs to make it. That said, as many as they've made, they rarely make them better than Scarface. In fact, the only drug movie I would say that's maybe better than Scarface would be the third act of Goodfellas, but I'm kind of partial to that movie. I mean, even if you're not a movie buff, just not ever having seen Scarface, the amount of references you don't get in things is unreal. This is a highly parodied, highly referenced movie, and just happens to be a fantastic drug movie. Let me know in the comments below what you look forward to watching most. Also, help me thank the Patreon supporters. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, you can check the link in the description below and see what that's all about, or you can follow the link to become a channel member where you'll get access to exclusive videos so that you never run out of good movies to watch. But I will keep making videos like this one as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for checking out this list, and you will see me on the next one.